Hi everybody, we're going to start. I think it's a, it's a tough job to start the afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope you had interesting interaction and I mean from the noise I've heard it seems that it was a great lunch. So just a quick note on the afternoon session. So we, are, we have four main blocks. So we start with this panel on the role of impact investment to achieve the SDG. Then we'll move into the conversation around impact measurement. We've got a break, as usual, very short break, coffee break, and then we'll break into five different sessions. Two of the sessions will be here and in the Ormo, and three of the sessions are uh, first floor. I would um, advise to take the stairs rather than take the lift, because it's gonna take ages if you, if you go to the first floor through the lift, so please take the stairs. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll finalize the day with a conversation ar around the role of philanthropy to achieve the SDG. So let me welcome um, all our panelists and Karen Wilson who will moderate uh, that session and she will introduce the speaker as well. Great. Uh I need to turn it off? No, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Yeah, okay, no. don't touch it. I didn't touch. You didn't see me touch it? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Should we work it? Is it? Okay, great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Wilson with the OECD. I'm leading our work at OECD on uh, social impact investment. And um, for those of you that don't know the OECD, uh, we're an international organization, but really we're like a big think tank, um, and we're working on building the evidence base in the social impact investment market. Um, so if everyone can just grab a seat. Um, those in the back having a conversation, those in the back in the green dress, if you would like to go outside. I also, <laughs> they're like bad students, huh? Misbehaved students in a... <laughs> I teach, so they better be careful. Do you, please uh, grab a seat, thank you. Great, so, um, so really what we wanted to do today, I mean obviously we've got a fantastic panel here and we've got a very hot topic and uh, we really wanna have a conversation with you all about uh, what it means to uh, invest in the context of the SDGs. Um, you know, we know that the SDGs have gathered momentum as a framework for achieving impact. You know, certainly the international community is really excited about it, and more and more companies are talking about it as well. But what do the investors really think, and what are they really doing? And so in this panel, we want to really have a discussion about uh, impact investing, the role they play in the context of the SDGs, um, look at some concrete examples of what's really happening, and also how you measure impact and how you think about um, impact and also financial objectives. So I'm really delighted to have this great panel here with us today. Um, but before I introduce them, I actually wanted to ask all of you very quickly. Okay, the first question is really easy, so I expect full participation. How many of you have heard of the SDGs? I think you wouldn't be in the room if you didn't know. Okay, very good, okay. How many of you care about the SDGs? 
And be honest. Okay, okay, everyone cares. Okay, that's good. Um, that's very nice. How many of you actually are trying in some way to measure what you do against the SDGs? Wow, okay, so we have a very advanced, experienced audience here. Okay, that's, that's very good to know. Okay, so let me briefly introduce um, the panelists. Um, so first of all, in the end here, we're very happy to have uh, 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 Rokas here with us. Uh, Rokas uh, Mamarts, he's the CEO and member of the executive management at Responsibility. And we were told his plane was only arriving at 2 p.m., but he's here in advance. So that just shows you how incredible this man is. So th thank you for, uh, thank you for being here with us. So, um, we also have uh, Salma Sadat. She's a founding board member of Impacted Africa Network, and she's also chairperson of the South African Impact Investing Network, SIAN. So we're very happy to have uh, you here, Salma, with us. Um, also, we have um, Kate um, <coughs> Cacciatore. Cacciatore, yes, my Italian needs a little brushing up. Um, she's the global head of sustainability at Edmund uh, de Rothschild Group here in Geneva, and we're really happy to have her here. She's um, filling in for one of her colleagues, and I have to say she's probably the most prepared on the panel, so we're really <laughs> delighted to have her here with us. And then also we have uh, Akbar Khan. He's the chief executive of Intelligro, which is part of the Intelli Group. Uh, there we go. Great. Okay, thank you. So, um, so basically what I wanted to do is just start very, very briefly with each person just saying very briefly what your organization does and how you're involved in impact investing. Very brief. And we'll have a little agreement with the audience here. If we think you're going too long, I'll just give a little time out. So, um, so we'll start with Rokas, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting and having the opportunity to say, what are we doing with regard to impact investment? We are a Swiss-based asset manager. We manage 3.3 billion, uh, are doing this since 15 years, and have sometimes the problems in these type of occasions. We say, what are you doing with regard to the SDG? So we have been placing 7 billion over the 15 years, and each investment has been in relation to the SDGs. It's only the problem that 15 years ago, there were no SDGs. So we are doing basically only this. We call it development investment because we only invest in developing emerging economies. We don't do impact investment in Europe or in the US. Great. Okay, um, thanks, Caro. Um, I'm part of Impact South Africa, and what we do is we essentially have, um, through quite a bit of research, identified the um, challenges and constraints that we have within Africa around building a robust um, impact investing um, system. And we have therefore um, mobilized the stakeholders within the industry in Africa to address these. And Impact South Africa essentially drives that um, to ensure that we are able to build the ecosystem. Um, I started at a much a smaller scale um, in Southern Africa, so this is just um, taking it up quite a notch. Um, in terms of the SDGs, obviously um, one of the thematic areas we focus on is around impact measurement, and so it plays a, a really big role. But um, in my previous life, um, I worked as a consultant, and so uh, part of that was working with fund managers and um, helping them to articulate their social impact into the various frameworks that we have. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm representing Edmond de Rothschild Private Equity, which is part of the Edmond de Rothschild Group. Um, the platform has over three billion in assets under management. Um, it covers 11 investment strategies, uh, which have uh, over 170 companies within the portfolios and 100 professionals. Um, from an impact perspective, there are three categories of fund in the platform, so mainstream strategies with ESG integration, thematic strategies with ESG integration, such as health and biotechnology, Africa and Latin America, and impact investing funds, which set out to have a measurable, positive social and environmental impact alongside a competitive return on investment. Today, we have um, impact investing funds represent 11% of the assets under management and 93% of the assets under management of the platform are covered by a formal ESG integration strategy or an impact investing strategy. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Akbar Khan. I'm part of uh, the Avishkar IntelliCap group. Uh, we've been uh, in, in the impact investing space since uh, the early 2000s. 
We've got about uh, 500 million uh, US dollars under management, and that is uh, broadly across uh, debt and equity products. So really the sectors that we are focused on are really the ones that the SDGs are actually addressing. So it's really healthcare, education, financial inclusion, um, you know, poverty alleviation, et cetera, et cetera. So very happy to be here and um, looking forward to this discussion. Great, thank you. Um, if we pass the microphone back down to, to Rokas. Um, so you said that you all have been investing uh, anyway in areas under the SDGs for the last 15 years. How do you, do you think about it differently? Do you think about investments differently now that the SDGs are there? How do you measure against them? Do you, do you map to them? How do you, how do you think about investing in this context? Mm, no, probably I have to disappoint you here. No, we don't think different. And uh, let me be very frank and very, uh, because uh, it's great. We, we, we think it's a great thing that the SDGs are there because you talk to investors who are not now very close to what we are doing. It helps in communication. It helps in identifying what are we talking about, what is the whole topic about. So in this sense, that's very helpful. Um, it has certain downsides, of course, because you know you do this, then people start saying, oh, now we do SDGs, and I tick three boxes, and oh, I'm doing something SDG. That's not what we do, <laughs> because we basically have been building this up and always have been targeting, like before also you said in India, kind of everything which, which we do is related into pushing forward an inclusive growth. So we don't specifically and now say due to the SDGs, this is kind of, it's kind of yes, the SDGs were basically covering up with what we have been doing, and so it helps us in communication. On measuring, we measure anyway, but the way we do it, we don't use the SDGs as the key orientation there. We do six impact themes, which we already had all the time, but those six impact themes encompass all the 17 SDGs. Yeah, so that's the way we deal with it. Akbar? Yes, so, so for us, actually, what we see SDGs as is really an accelerator. Uh, and what it's really done is that it's actually really brought the sort of social and environmental agenda to the, to the world. I mean, if you look at the numbers that are being put out there, it's uh, to actually achieve the uh, SDGs by 2030, it's two and a half trillion dollars across various asset classes every year. So clearly impact investing is one part of it, and I think we have uh, significantly benefited from the fact that it's got you know, governments talking about it, it's got organizations like UNDP talking about it in a very, very big and programmatic way. So for us, you know, as Roka said, we've been doing this for a long time, but it, I think what's really happened is that there's a very good articulation of the issues at hand and how one should address them. I don't want to let that microphone too far out of my hands. Um, uh, Salma, I'll come to you next. Um, and I just wanted to add before that, I mean, one of the very powerful things about the SDGs, particularly as opposed to the MDGs, is that they apply to both developed and developing countries. The MDGs were really, in some ways, developed countries telling developing countries what their targets had to be. This time, it was all countries together working out the targets. They apply to everyone. I think that's very important. Uh, the other thing, as you were saying, it really provides a framework that also links some of these different initiatives. You know, you have the people working on social issues uh, in one community, all the people in the environment uh, community, uh, the COP, you know, uh, discussions in, in another room. And so it's also a way to help link and, and build partnerships. Salma, what have you seen from some of the fund managers that you've been working with in terms of how they think about the SDGs? Do they? Do they care? Do they measure so, to it? So many of them uh, don't or didn't um, until we came on board. So really the way we worked with the fund managers is um, they were interested in impact investing. They liked the concept of it, but they had no clue because it wasn't you know, part of what they do. Um, we then came on board as partners to really help them to, um, and, and the way we looked at it was, okay, your role as a fund manager is really to worry about the financials. And you don't need to be an expert on the social impact, at least not yet. So let us worry about that. We'll work with you in partnership. And that's how we developed. And we got to a point of working them with them for a number of years before it became a kind of um, common conversation where you know both the financial and the social was actually something that that they were comfortable to speak about. So it was a process, I think, um, and and I find that that's something we we 
kind of overlook is that um, they're not necessarily um, that way naturally inclined. You know, um, very early in the conversation, everything we heard was, yes, but what about the financial return? You know, we're not compromising on that, so don't ask us to. And it's, we're actually not asking you to. It's, it's fine. You know, so it was, it was a long process. Great. Um, and I want to come back to this issue about financial return and impact mm -hmm. um, next. But first, I wanted to hear from Kate about how Rothschilds is thinking about uh, mm -hmm. the SDGs. Yeah, I, I can agree with some of the other panel members on the fact that this isn't necessarily new for us to be thinking about the sustainability challenges and opportunities. But what is different with the SDGs now having really gained some momentum is that it has sharpened the, the focus and the thinking of the international community on some of these challenges and opportunities. And it's also given us a common language to be able to discuss these topics with others and including with you know investors and private investors as well who can... Uh, private clients who can really um, resonate with some of these topics more easily. Um, so I think we, we have now started systematically reporting and thinking about our contribution in the context of the, um, the SDGs. And, and so we are able to articulate our impact in terms of which one. So we'll have maybe two or three SDGs that a specific investment strategy will contribute to in a core way and then make up to five or six others. Um, but, of course, each investment strategy is unique in our case because we have niche strategies, and so there'll be um, a specific set of KPIs that we will measure at the portfolio level and then aggregate. Um, so everything has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Great. Actually, if we can just stay with you mm -hmm. for a minute um, and uh, move to this topic that Sama brought up. Um, how do you all think about the financial return and the impact, and how do you, how do you balance that? Well, we make a clear distinction between those of our investment strategies that fall into the category of ESG integration and, and thematic funds and the impact investing. Because from an ESG perspective, obviously managing that risk and looking for opportunities supports the long-term return on investment. So that's the, the starting point. But when it comes to the impact investing funds, this is where really social and environmental issues go to the very heart of the strategy and will generate financial return. So I can give the example of our soil remediation investment strategy. So what the, the fund does is acquire heavily polluted ex-industrial sites in prime locations in European cities, cleans them, rehabilitates them completely with cutting-edge technologies, and then reallocates them for development um, for, for sustainable urban planning. And so the, um, the, the value, the profit that's generated by that environmental activity is able to generate a return on investment of between 10 to 15 percent, which is completely in line with the market practice. And it's really an example of the kind of win-win um, market or business model that we seek to put in place. Um, we, we, we know that our investors are seeking that and that they, mainstream investors won't be able to sacrifice performance. Great. Rokas, I wanted to come back to you on this question. Uh, how do you all think about financial return and impact? Mm, simply speaking, first, we are not an impact-first investor. So that, I mean, I think to clarify, because there are impact-first investors, which is nothing wrong, we are not. Uh, we think to achieve scale, to achieve size, uh, we cannot compromise on return. To give you an example, our largest investors, institutional investors, so Swiss pension funds, we of course ask them, so why do you invest or, or what's pushing you forward? It's not the impact story. <laughs> Let me be very frank. Yeah, I mean, they have fiduciary responsibilities, which I think they're clearly understood. Uh, so they invest because it is an attractive investment. Now, what it means being an attractive investment, that's a complex story because that has not only to do with return, it has to do with risk return profiles. It has to do with diversification. And there, of course, each portfolio manager has to look into this and to analyze whether this makes sense from a portfolio perspective. And I can say for that client, it completely makes sense that on top, of course, there is the impact or there is a social impact coming with that. That's nice to, to have it on top of that. But I think we should be very clear if you really would like to size up that uh, return is crucial. But um, just to come back for a minute, in the very beginning you said that you've been uh, investing for the SDGs for the last 15 years. Inherently, the areas that responsibility focuses on are geared to have some impact, to have yes. high impact. 
So is that the case? Is that why you have then the freedom to really say that we're focused on the financial return because we know everything that we're selecting already is focused on impact? Um, you made it sound like, you know, if the impact comes, it's, it's great on top. But actually, no. you all have a clear no. strategy, right, or not? Uh, no, absolutely. I think then I probably that's a misunderstanding. I haven't yeah. been clear enough. So what we do is we look at the financial return at the investment opportunity as such. So it has to be an attractive investment opportunity first. Then we look second, each investment goes through an ESG risk check. So but that's a risk perspective. And then third, we of course we only invest when we see that from our perspective, the impact which we would try to achieve, for example, if I take a topic like energy efficiency, or I take a topic like microfinance, you might take it, or agriculture finance, only if we see this drives forward inclusive growth to the standard which we would like to see, then it's an investment where we say, yeah, that's an investment we are interested in. The interesting part is you can do the three things together and you find attractive investment opportunities. And our role, we understand our role in this whole game as we are basically bridging. And so we are making these investment opportunities accessible for institutional investors in Europe or in the developed world. That's what we, in essence, what we are doing. Great, thank yeah. you. That was very helpful. And I think that also echoes what you were saying, Kate, about the fact that you can have uh, good, decent financial returns and also have high impact. Akbar, you're, ex okay, I will. <laughs> Only I'll for you. I'll it's give it back to you for sure. We <laughs> won't go beyond this. <laughs> So we look at it very much the same way. So our thesis is that we only invest in impact sectors. It's not necessarily that we'll compromise our commercial return for impact, but the sectors that we will invest in uh, will be impact-based sectors. So for us, it's really seeing ourselves as sector specialists where we can identify opportunities within these six or seven spaces where we can actually uh, be better positioned than other asset allocators who are not necessarily looking at impact uh, and being able to understand the business model, work with the sort of the entrepreneurs in the companies, and create that sort of return. And the advantage that we have is that we have uh, access to multiple asset classes. So we have, uh, you know, we have equity funds as well as debt. So depending on the the asset itself and the requirements of the company, we're able to actually provide that particular pool of capital to the company. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, great. And Selma, did you want to add? You already, we got started with you on this topic, but uh, great. Okay. So, um, so then I wanted to move to the next uh, um, item. Uh, can we hear a little bit more about some of the concrete examples of investments that you all have been involved in? Selma, maybe starting with you. Sure. Um, so, uh, like I said, we, we actually work with fund managers, so the investments wouldn't have come directly from us, but based on um, the ones we have worked on, I think the ones um, that have been really interesting for me are the ones we've seen um, who started in the fund in around early um, 2007 um, and the growth that they've gone through. So um, when they started, they were very early stage sort of entrepreneurs, um, really kind of didn't have... Um, much idea around um, the you know the impact side and, and what they should be tracking what they should be looking at and, and to a large extent not necessarily aware that they were actually um, impact entrepreneurs either um, and the growth and development that we've had over that time so one of the examples is um, in the low income housing um, so we have uh, you know there was a company um, that looked at um, inner city regeneration, especially in Johannesburg. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to Johannesburg, um, the Hillbrow area, very thriving during the 1980s and then completely um, decayed. We had a lot of um, criminal elements moving in. It really became quite a no-go zone. Um, so really what they're looking at is actually cleaning all of that up, but providing low-income housing. Um, bringing people in from Soweto, et cetera, you know, and, and bringing them into the inner city. And what we've seen in terms of the recovery of the economy in those, in those areas, what we've seen in terms of um, the um, 
the sort of plow back into the city's coffers around because these were buildings that had been taken over by um, sort of rogue elements. There were no uh, taxes paid. There were, you know, so we've seen all of that actually um, coming back into. And what was interesting for me was taking the entrepreneurs through the journey of first not really focusing on, on their impact to the point of really understanding the value of articulating your impact and tying it to the different kind of... So it was very interesting in saying, well, okay, there's SDGs, there's also the national development plans that we have, there's Agenda 2063, so which one am I going to actually focus on? Um, you know, because I want to, I want to target government as potential um, sponsors or donors. I want to um, target international, um, you know, DFIs who who want to know about the SDGs. I want to uh, target Africa-specific who are looking at Agenda, you know, 2063. Um, and it's bringing all those elements together and saying, well, depending on your audience, you can actually tailor what you're talking about from your impact to suit each one. Um, and it's the journey of to the point where now they actually have in-house their own um, impact measurement team that focuses solely on being able to articulate the impact that they have through the work they do. So I think that's that's been quite an incredible journey. Great. Um, I wanted to pick up on this topic of impact measurement for a moment. Um, how much impact measurement is too much, actually. You talked in the beginning that it can be hard to get some of these organizations to do it, and you talked about the way you bring them along, which is great, because it is a process. Um, um, but maybe, uh, Akbar, since you're nodding your head, what has been your experience in terms of um, impact measurement and working with the uh, investees, the portfolio companies, in terms of providing the kind of information that you're looking for? So clearly, that is one of the most challenging aspects of uh, in impact investing. Uh, it's really the ability to get that data and actually get, th uh, you know, sort of things that you can actually measure and actually benchmark against other uh, sort of companies or other, uh, you know, organizations creating impact. So I think the data is getting better and better. I think what one really needs to understand is that, you know, you can try and, you know, align it around three or four basic kind of uh, measurements such as, you know, CO2 emissions, uh, livelihoods created, uh, number of uh, jobs created, et cetera, et cetera. But it's generally not going to be that simple because we know life is complicated and we know, uh, you know, impact is complicated. So I think it's a, so it's a very much in process uh, sort of exercise that is going on. And, you know, it's up to a lot of the sort of international institutions to come together and try and put together certain standardized formats that one can be held accountable to. Okay, and that was not planned. You don't know about the OECD <laughs> data <laughs> initiative. Okay, okay, well, thank you for that then. Um, so, uh, Rokas, I wanted to come back to you again. Uh, Responsibility um, has uh, done a lot of really great research and pulled together a lot of very interesting data. So how do you all um, measure impact and get this data that helps show the impact that your investments have had? That's, of course, always the, the favorite question which comes up. How do we deal with measurement? Uh, and, I have uh, and one coming up. Ah, okay, the tough one. No, no, but isn't it because it always comes up and, and uh, it's interesting. Let me, let me, oh. let me uh, first, I think there is, there is the issue of concept. Yeah, I mean, here are all the experts kind of, yeah, what do we measure? Output, outcome, impact? What are we measuring, actually, hmm? when we say impact measurement? And to be very frank, I mean, we all know impact measurement in the true sen sense, that's an academic exercise. This can be done. It is not easy. So we can measure a lot, but to make sure that we are measuring impact is not easy. That's a conceptual issue. It's great, for example, we do financing of 50,000 energy efficiency projects. There's a software deployed, it's measured again the baseline, and I can tell you exactly it's 32% or 38% CO2 reduction. That's the best case for us, because so simple, that's relatively simple. But when it comes to even jobs created, have we been creating the jobs, or was it the circuit? You know, you know all of it, so that's complicated. The good test is with investors, which I like very often to do, because when the discussion comes up, you say, wonderful. 
why don't we do the following? So we charge 100 basis points on top and we measure. Normally the discussion very quickly comes to an end. Kind of, and you say a lot of institutional investors being cost sensitive with all the reasons also. And that I think is a factor which we clearly have to keep in mind. Huh? Um, yes, one can do more effort, putting effort into measurement, uh, but there's a cost involved. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we are very cost sensitive and we know a lot of our investors are cost sensitive. When they really have to make the choice, giving up a certain return per year against a measurement, a lot of investors are relatively <coughs> pragmatic. I have to say that we have a little bit the, the good luck that, I mean, we are in developing countries, we are in emerging economies. We're doing three sectors, agriculture. I mean, agriculture, financial inclusion, and energy, access to energy. So there is some basic understanding that it might be impactful if you're doing it successful. So nevertheless, we do measurement, we, we, we concentrate on output, we do outcome where feasible. I think technology plays into our hands. It can help to do a better job. But please be also aware, huh? cost and being conceptually, not to overdo it, I think it's very important. If we would sit here in this conference and tell, tell all investors, of course, and we are going to measure everything. I mean, any serious analysis which will be done will, after two hours, show you that it was not such a serious job. So I think we have to be very transparent and say, this we can do, this we can't do. And there are people who don't like it. And that's also okay. Not everybody has an, so that, that's at least our approach. Great, thank you. Yeah, and uh, measuring impact is difficult for many of the reasons that you mentioned. I mean, the, the main one being causality. I mean, how do you even, what is impact and how do you prove causality? But also whose vision of impact and at what part of the value chain? Everyone has a different view of the kind of impact that they, that they wanna see. Um, and so this is, uh, this is uh, really a, a big challenge. Please, yes. No, only to, sorry yeah, for, but, yeah. but I think a point which is, from my understanding, not sufficiently stressed is, a, what I like about the SDGs, these are 17, which shows it has a certain complexity. Hmm? <laughs> because otherwise it would be four. <laughs> so that would be relatively simple. And the other thing is, when it comes to impact measurement, typically number nine, industry infrastructure and market development innovation. So structural development is typically not measured and, 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 and really weighted enough in this whole discussion. The focus goes always to, oh, how many lives do we touch? How is, which is nothing bad about it, huh? But we all know a sustainable development needs infrastructure, needs systems to be built, to be sustainable in that approach. And that, I think, is something all of the, the measurement systems which have been developed, I think they typically don't grasp that part sufficiently. We try to do that. It's a challenging part to do that, but I, I think there is where the clue for development is. And, and so we should have that clearly in mind. Sorry for, yeah. I just came Absolutely. up. Absolutely, no, thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, there are so many levels of uh, impact and so many levels of, uh, of measuring. And the problem is uh, the, the closer you are to the market and to the beneficiaries, and everyone's talking about how important it is to hear the voice of the beneficiary and measure the actual um, uh, outcomes on the ground, but then you can't aggregate that kind of data. So it's all very specific to the investment that's been made. Um, I wanted to turn to Kate, um, and maybe through an example of one of your investments, you could talk us through how you all um, look at uh, um, uh, investing within the SDGs and also measure the impact uh, on that? Yeah, we, we take a very pragmatic approach and we'll focus on a small number of areas where we want to have impact and we believe we can have impact and where we can have uh, data that's meaningful and relevant. So I wanted to give you the example of our agroforestry strategy, which is active in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> So it invests in companies and projects that rehabilitate agricultural land and improves the income levels of farmers in, in those countries through outgrower schemes and the development of, for example, processing plants for key local agricultural produce. So we've actually been able to project forward in, in terms of 10-year objectives. So we want to have returns generated for investors of between 10 to 12 percent. We want to create 9,000 jobs, jobs directly associated with the activities that we're investing in. 25,000 hectares of land restored to a, a high level in terms of sustainability and 20,000 farmers who benefit. 
And the kind of KPIs that we are looking at the, at the portfolio level um, that we can track reliably are wages paid, numbers of farmers integrated in outgrowing schemes, number of farmers trained or benefiting from a finance scheme, carbon sequestered, number of trees planted and proportion of local tree species, which is very important, and we can use satellite imagery to determine some of these points. Number of wildlife species present, including those on the IUCN red list of threatened species. And so we uh, um, measure that impact in terms of um, input, output, outcomes, and final impact. And we can link those to two key SDGs, climate action and life on land, but also uh, to a lesser extent, gender equality, where we have the aim to achieve a 40% employment rate of women in the investments concerned, but also affordable and clean energy, especially through the use of biomass connected with the agricultural uh, activities, and the partnerships for SDG 17, because of the very strong alliance with technical and scientific partners, strong network of private companies and NGOs and, uh, and investors. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm debating whether I should come at this other big question now or save it a little bit for later. Um, maybe I'll save it for the next round. Um, Akbar, can you tell us a little bit about um, the kind of partners that you all work with? So I'd say we've got partners at two levels. One is clearly the um, governments. And when I say governments, I think it's also working much more with the sort of local uh, local government levels to actually get their support uh, with respect to you know getting buy-in and you know the general necessary kind of support that one needs uh, when one is uh, working in the in the rural economy but clearly the ones that we actually call our partners are the ones that are actually f facing and experiencing the impact um, and a good example that I would give is uh, and a sector that we're very much focused on is in the uh, dairy processing sector and there we've been very instrumental in actually improving the livelihoods of some of the uh, dairy farmers who, quite frankly, uh, till we had gone into this one particular sector, uh, one particular uh, state in, in the country, um, they were being very badly uh, impacted by the fact that they couldn't really hold the, the milk over an extended period of time and they had to actually sell it uh, at rock bottom prices. So what we actually went out and actually did was uh, funded a chilling plant for an existing dairy company that was able to actually uh, you know, hold milk for these uh, 20, 25,000 uh, farmers uh, and thereby you know, de-risking them from the sort of pricing of the uh, product. And also it's considerably increasing their livelihoods in that they didn't only have to wait for two or three times in the year to actually produce the milk, but actually be able to service these dairy farms and their end customers uh, across the year. Uh, so for us, it's really partnering with the, uh, with the people who are really experiencing the impact. Great, and I'm getting the signal to open up to the audience, but I, I, I just wanted to come back on something you said and, and build upon something that you actually said before the session, and that is the importance of really engaging the local partners on the ground. Uh, we saw, we did a workshop in, uh, in Nairobi looking at impact investing across Africa, and there's so many investors that are flying in and flying out, and that's just not sustainable if you aren't really working with, um, with, with partners on the ground. Um, I will open up to the audience, but before I do that, I did just want to come back to this uh, other big issue of returns. Um, in impact investing, you know, there are people that are you know, trying to sell that you can have the greatest returns ever and the greatest uh, social impact ever. Um, so, Rokas, uh, uh, since you did so well with the other difficult question, I'm going to start with you on this one. And meanwhile, please think of your questions. I'm going to take questions uh, in groups, and then we'll come back to the panel. I think it's very simple. There, there are good and attractive returns. Are these the best and highest financial returns you ever can get? I, I don't think so. I, I, I think there are sectors or, or there are investments which you might also take higher risk where you have all the financial engineering taking place. Look, we do private equity, but this is straight private equity, growth capital, no gearing, no leverage, nothing. So imagine now in US, you do a, a highly geared private equity transaction. It's a completely different thing. So I, I think there we should be very clear. We are investing in the real economy. We are investing in growth. There are attractive returns. 
And um, I, I think it's important. Typically in private equity, it comes up kind of. And I, I find it interesting recently in the conference, uh, one of these, I think Cambridge or so, they were on the panel and, and they collect all this data. And they said, look, if somebody enters into your room and basically presents and pitches your private equity fund and tells you this is a 25% plus, just tell him there's a door because it's not going to happen because the data also shows this is also not anymore the time. So I think there, look, there are attractive returns and, and that's okay. But that there might be sectors where you can be more successful. I think that's okay because we also cannot absorb all the capital of this world. <laughs> so I think that's fine. No? Sama, did you want to add to that? Um, I think I, I would definitely agree. I think what we, what we found is that um, with, with the managers we worked with, they really looked at, is this a, f a sound financial model? You know, is this business really going to be successful? In that case, I'm really happy to invest into it. And, you know, and yes, they, they got their returns. Like you say, were they the most fantastic returns? Who knows, you know, but they, they got what they really wanted to invest for. And yes, it came with, you know, really great um, social impact, but as, you know, the, the point was they specifically looked for investments that had social impact, but they spent a lot of time ensuring that that business model made sense and that there was a very strong likelihood that it was going to succeed. So, you know, I, I don't see that it was any different to any other investment that they would have done. It doesn't, uh, it didn't, the rules didn't change just for an impact investment. Great. Okay, I promise to open up to the audience, so I'm going to do that. Otherwise, I have plenty of questions I can keep going. There's a hand over here um, and behind and over there and over here. I don't know how many mics we have, but if we can get the mics moving that we can take the questions uh, quickly. And please uh, briefly introduce yourself and ask a question, a short one, preferably. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Sonia Leonard. I come from the European Investment Bank and um, I work in our small results team. Uh, and I just have a very specific question to Kate and very short answer, I believe. Um, do you do ex-ante assessments and are you monitoring? How do you think you're going to measure this 40% female, uh, you know? Uh, are you just want to know what is the system that you use? Because you mentioned a lot of output, you're reaching this many people. And I mean, have you reached them already or is this something that you are expecting to achieve or? Okay, and as I said, we're gonna take a bunch of questions together. So who has the next mic okay. over here? Yeah. Mary Jean Buer from EPFL, uh, College of Management of Technology. I have a question about um, the potential crowding out of, um, let's say, social impact ventures, uh, investments in social impact ventures where the social impact is difficult to quantify. Um, and I wonder if we go too far into trying to measure all the impact in a very um, let's say, uh, uh, rigorous way and correct way, let's say, academically or so, uh, we may uh, miss out on very good investments that could have a, a very big impact, but we're just difficult to quantify. For example, education, the impact of educating people in a good way, how do you measure that in something uh, rigorous you know, so that you can really be sure of the, of the potential? You know, there we don't know. It could have an, imp uh, an incredible potential, but you don't know how to quantify it and one could, of course, make assumptions, but I would be careful not to, uh, of course, impact needs to be measured for certain types of investments, but I would compare it to something like uh, policies. We have a need for a mix of policies. Policies, um, for example, emissions trading has a role, but we also need policies like responsible investment policies that address you know, strategic um, changes in, in, in for towards an energy transition or so on. So there's a need for a mix of types of investors, including from philanthropists to impact investors to other types of investors, in order to get all the different kinds of investments. Thank you. And, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So please, short questions, because we had many people that had their hands up. But uh, thank Derek you. Derek Kweiser, we advise it to public and private capital owners. I'll try to be concise. Scalability is key uh, to reach the SDGs. Some uh, analysis say that 80% of the capital required to meet them will come from the private sector. So my question is about actually how to achieve scale. Do you have some type of public-private partnerships? Do you have some other type of infrastructure plays maybe where the best solution could be deployed? And maybe actually how could you attract institutional capital owners? Thank you. Great, okay, there were, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Moussin. I'm a social entrepreneur uh, for the last 10 years. 
I think everybody will agree with me that if you look at the SDG goals, it's impossible to meet them. If, if, we, if we reach 10%, we, uh, it will be a miracle. And I don't think anybody believes in miracles around here. So uh, I'm really concerned when I hear a lot of discussions about uh, measuring impact. We're talking about a miracle to reach 10%. Why do we want to measure how much we are failed? <coughs> and I you know, take this with a grain of salt in the sense that we are not focusing on the real problem. The only, our only chance to meet any of these goals is we need some serious innovation. And, uh, and from my experience as working in this field, the innovation will come from uh, startups, only startup, mostly from startups. And the biggest problem that I think we should be talking about today is there are um, the majority of impact investor in their mandate, they cannot and they will not invest in innovation. That's their mandate. And the few who, uh, who say, uh, yes, it's our mandate, from my personal experience, they uh, really have the, uh, the experience or the skills to invest in startup innovation. And even what's making me really, and you can see the, I'm not uh, very happy, they don't even have in place a mechanism to become good at investing in innovation and uh, startups. And uh, my last comment, I would highly uh, recommend in future panels that talk about impact investment, have at least one or two social entrepreneurs sharing their perspective and giving a context to where we are trying to go. Thank you. Absolutely, and th thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that. That's a very good point. And I was talking to some entrepreneurs, some social entrepreneurs earlier today, and also hearing, in, as we heard in our workshop that we did in Africa earlier in the year, the, the talk you hear from the investors is very different than the reality on the ground for the entrepreneurs. So thank you for bringing that reality into the discussion. Um, there's a lot to say on it, and I think all of us on the panel, and I may have to jump in on that one as well when we, when we get to it. So thank you very much. You are a de facto panel member, so thank you for jumping in. Uh, there were some other hands. Uh, there's one in the back there, and then I think we'll go to the panel unless there's someone I can't see. Uh, one in the, two in the middle here. Okay. So where, is, where are the mics? There are two people here, and there's one in the back. Raise your hands high. They, they can see you. Thank you. My name is Dominic. Um, quick question. So if you would like to increase impact investment as an investment class in the next five years tenfold, do you think the bottleneck is in finding investment opportunities or do you think it is in raising funds from potential impact investors? Um, my second question on this is, sorry? Where is oh, the bottleneck in increasing Whether it is in increasing, right? um, if you would like to increase it in the next ten years or five years tenfold, whether you see the bottleneck in identifying investment opportunities that qualifies in pink impact investment or in raising funds from potential impact investors. Um, and a related second question is, do you think it would open up as an investment class for retail investments, so small scale investments by individuals? Great, okay, and there was someone right behind you and then we'll go to the lady in the back and then that's, uh, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you. Uh, I'm Govinda. I'm a social entrepreneur working in clean tech and training side. I'm just wondering, like, when we go for impact investment and they ask for so much of data from us, and it's hard as an entrepreneur to get all this data, and then sometimes it's, it, looks, it becomes awkward. So I'm just wondering, like, as in impact investors from all of you, like, what kind of es essential data you look for, and after that you say, okay, if you do this, it's good, but it's okay, we'll move on with you. Great, okay, and we talked a little bit about data earlier, but maybe we can just pick up on some highlights. Okay, and uh, last but not least, please. Uh, Thank you, um, I'm a social entrepreneur also. I'm from Sri Lanka. And uh, Kate, uh, I think I fit absolutely every single box you, you talked about. Um, I'm in the renewable energy business. I, I beg to differ from my friend over there uh, because we are a, 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 a biomass business and we resource from smallholder farmers. We currently have 200,000 smallholder farmers. And because it was very difficult to uh, prove what I'm talking about, I was very lucky to have investment from InfraCoAsia, 
And the PIDG group is now funding a three-year impact measurement. And I wanted very much to have that done separately so that we would be able to uh, have our business model scrutinized. And then from an environmental perspective, I'm right now in negotiations with Greenpeace because they're the just, toughest. I'm sorry. Can but you I just, just want to say question? to you that okay. the question, that my, my response was actually to this gentleman saying it's impossible. I don't think it's impossible. And I don't think it's something that is impossible to achieve as an entrepreneur. What you have to do is to figure out a way to get whoever is investing in you to fund the research. That's okay. what I want to say. Great. Thank you. So I think we can have a long debate. You've opened up a... Where, where are you? You've opened up a, a huge debate here. We could have a whole other session on that. That'll be over drinks later. Okay, so Akbar, let's start with you um, and please address the questions. Uh, right. Just a few, if everyone addresses a few questions, hopefully we can cover them all in the next uh, 10 minutes. So I, I can attempt the one on, uh, you know, how do we scale and what are the sort of associated bottlenecks in impact investing? I mean, the, the whole discussion around impact investing has changed quite, uh, quite dramatically over the last, uh, you know, last five or six years. Um, you know, this whole concept of conventional mainstream investing and then impact investing being a, a different kind of asset class, I think that has significantly blurred in the last couple of years. I think, you know, prof uh, fund, conventional fund managers now are looking at uh, this as a serious asset class. Uh, where you know they clearly see there is appetite from uh, their LPs and uh, family offices to invest in. So for me, I don't think the bottleneck is really capital. I think capital will actually be available. I think it's the sort of sector specialization that needs to develop further. I think just like any sort of investing, whether it's tech investing or it's infrastructure investing, uh, impact investing has its own sort of uh, specializations. And I think we need to develop uh, beyond just an ecosystem, but people who actually understand the space and become sector specialists to actually be able to deploy capital. Yeah, and I think that also gets back to um, our first entrepreneur's question about you know maybe some of these impact investors would be less ris risk adverse and really willing to invest in innovation if they really deeply understood it. Right now, a lot of impact funds are generalists, they're not specialists. Okay, uh, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I would actually like to address the scalability subject as well. Um, to make impact investing funds possible in the first place and then make them accessible to a wider panel of investors, um, individual private investors, um, mainstream institutional investors, we need the support of development finance institutions. So we will uh, very often, if not always, partner even in the governance structure of our impact investing funds with DFIs. For our agroforestry fund has six international uh, or from national countries DFIs in the makeup, and they are the ones who put the seed money, who support from the outset, who take the important decisions about whether the model is right, whether it will work, and also who um, will provide seed money and de-risk um, in a number of different ways. Um, and the second point I wanted to make was, it's also about the people who are doing these investments learning. Um, we can pick up scale, we can become more efficient once we've tried a model. Just to give you an example, our agroforestry fund, it took the f one year to do the first deal for that fund. Now we can do four or five deals per year because we've, we've learnt the formula, we know the added value for the farmers, we can present it more effectively, etc. And we have other stories like that as well, so um, that's important. And I would just like to come back to that question about the, the gender. To be honest, I don't know and I w would have to put you in touch with my colleagues who, who deal with that data, so I won't try and answer in detail. Okay, um, I think I just want to come back to the question around how do you as a social entrepreneur um, tackle the issue of measurement um, and yes it's a really tough one the way we've worked with um, so in practical terms the way we've worked with our entrepreneurs is um, we've tied it very much to their kind of business model so what makes sense and what do you need to be tracking as a business and how do you use that as management information for you to improve your business anyway um, because once you do that, I think it just makes it a little bit easier for them to, to, to manage that. But if you run it as two separate things, you know, so you've got my regular business kind of reporting that I'm doing and then there's this thing on the side where I have to measure social impact. 
it, it doesn't work. So, and we, we really look at, you know, what are the kind of three big things that you need to be tracking? So we're not coming at you with 50 indicators and saying, please, can you report on all? Nobody has the time for that. Um, neither do we. So that, those are kind of the things, is really just saying, what are the important things in terms of what your investor wants to see? Um, and the investor also has to be really um, kind of practical and realistic about it. You know, what are the th what is the main important thing? Do you want to see jobs created? Then that's what we're going to look at. But then don't fund somebody who's not focusing on job creation and expect them to do that because then, then you're just, you know, not being fair, actually. Uh, there are a couple of topics, yeah. Uh, Starting from the retail funds, just because there was a question on retail, how to bring in the retail investors. So we run two retail funds. It's actually, we are in Switzerland, actually one of the front runners, let me say, globally in this. At, at the end of the day, it's driven by regulation. This is nothing you can just say, I want to do this. It's kind of the underlying assets have to fit for a fund and the regulator has to be fine with the whole setup. Otherwise, you can dream about a retail fund and also certain products shouldn't be offered to retail investors. But nevertheless, so that's a total volume of 1.2 billion, which is not nothing. Yeah, so, but I think it's a good start. Can there be much more? Yes, regulatory question. Then there was a question on how to bring in institutional capital, more institutional investors. So that has also to do with structures and size track record, so the whole, let's call it asset class, has to grow up for that. Uh, still, what we do, a lot of what we do is, there are the large institutional investors, it's much too small. <laughs> so, you, 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 they are not even interested in doing, oh, we can do 100 million. No, they're not interested because that, so here grows scale, it needs time, but I think there's a good start. And there is much more interest, and also the SDGs help here, I think, to just, you know, common communication platform and to bring in more people into the sector, I think that happens. There was another public-private partnership. Yes, we do. You mentioned beforehand it has been done. We also, I think it's a great thing to do because that helps to bring, for example, institutional investors or other type of investors um, into a topic which just as a standalone would be a little bit too risky for, to start with. Hopefully, of course, over time, the public sector can then draw back and say, okay, now that's fine, now the track record is there and you can do that. I completely agree with the comment which was made earlier, I don't know by whom or question there was. Yes, there is, I, I would agree, there is not today sufficiently really money who's willing to take higher risk. Um, we don't have the time to go back. Actually, that's quite interesting. So that was very different if I go back 20 years back, I had the chance to do certain things 30 years back. I'm not defending what has been done 30 years back, but there are certain things which happened which if they wouldn't have done with a very high risk-taking perspective 30 years back, a lot of us wouldn't be sitting here because we wouldn't do this investment which we are currently doing. So the venture approach, which is of course very tough huh, at a small scale, I'm not saying here this is an easy thing, but building again, that's building the infrastructure, building the institutional landscape. That is something I think we should give it some structured thinking. How can we do better? And I would say there, yes, typically development finance in the public sector who has a certain mission, do they really dare to do and go these days as active as they probably could do? I would say mm, no. Um, there, there, there could be a little bit more, yeah, but of course, um, it's difficult because, uh, yeah, there's also then a lot of risk and failures implied. But here we are. I stop here. There were much more questions, but... Fantastic. Yeah. Great. And uh, I'll just close because I'm getting the signal from the organizers. I just wanted to close um, referring to our fifth panelist there in the audience um, in terms of uh, being able to reach the SDGs. And I completely agree with you. Um, it's not just about money. Um, you know, if we're just throwing more money at the SDGs, we're never going to make it because the current approaches don't work. I think we see that. There's evidence all around us. And for me, what gets me really excited about impact investment and why I work on it is because uh, it's about bringing innovative new approaches into the market. I know you're not seeing that on the ground, you know, and there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of hype in the market. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that we're really um, uh, doing real impact investing. Of course, there is an investment spectrum. We don't have time to get into it at the moment. We'll have some investors 
that um, can't be as deeply involved in innovation that are investing on one side. There are other people that are really doing the high risk venture investing. We need all of these investors. We need the small money where they're investing more in innovation. We need the big money where it's a lot of money. Um, and maybe there's a little less innovation, maybe a little less, uh, um, anyway. Um, but uh, what's exciting about impact investing is that it can help facilitate this innovation and it also brings the responsibility, no pun intended, um, to, uh, to be accountable and to at least make some attempt at um, measuring or understanding the kind of impact that you're having, both positive and negative, because negative impact is also important to understand. So with that, I wanted to thank our fantastic panel. I know that we're um, out of time, unfortunately, and uh, we can talk further over the drinks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and Karen, you did the perfect transition to the next topic. Um, as we have seen already in, in, in that panel, uh, impact measurement is connects to uh, the role of um, investment for the SDG. So I would like to invite Marcos Neto, who is the moderator of that session. You're coming. He's coming. And I'd like to invite the different panelists of that session to come on stage. I'm here. You're here. <laughs> so, Marcos, I will let you introduce the different speakers. Yeah, they're all here. We're all here. Perfect. So you should have a seat. Sure.